hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. We welcome you here. Hope that you have felt welcome coming in to worship um, with us today at Grace. Again, we're just glad that you're here, and um, it's great to see everybody. Hope you received an order of worship on your way in this morning. Um, a few things I would like to point out to you in way of announcement. I'm not going to read everything, but I would hope that you would read and know what's going on in the life of the church. But a few things I would like to point out to you is if you have not already purchased... Um, Tickets for a barbecue fundraiser. Our Girls of Grace um, are, are doing a barbecue fundraiser Sunday, May 20th. You can purchase your uh, tickets outside on your way out the door um, this morning if you have not done that already. Um, also, Sunday, May the 20th, we'll be recognizing our graduates here from Grace United Methodist Church. Uh, we'll be recognizing our high school and our college graduates, and we have quite a few of those, so please keep that in mind. Um, also, we are notorious at Grace United Methodist Church for praying. We believe prayer changes things, and we believe prayer is the most we can always do. And we have a marvelous prayer team who is always ready and willing to pray for you and with you. Um, so please keep in mind, every Sunday after worship, there's a prayer room available. It's down the hall to the right, and it'll be um, on the left right past the ladies' restroom. Also, please note the, uh, the changes to the prayer hotline. Bless you. Um, the changes to the prayer hotline, the number's been changed when you have a different email. But for any prayer concern, you can keep that number, plug it in your phone, plug the email in your phone or whatever. And um, for any prayer concern you have going on, um, you can shoot a text, shoot an email. Everything's confidential, and that prayer team prays it up. And just kind of a way of, way of testimony, um, this past week there have been a variety, numerous praise reports that have come through because of what the prayer team's been praying for. And, and just, so just keep that in mind. Um, and then, by way of announcement, before we join together in the Apostles' Creed, um, many of you know, probably all of you know, Miss Kathy Reese will be retiring. Um, her final day is June 28th. Um, SPRC has been working hard in getting uh, the word out and receiving resumes, applications, um, and we, we received all of those, went through an interview process, and we have chosen um, the one who will take Kathy's place. And it is Miss Denise Todd. And I would ask Denise, you and your family here with us today, if y'all will stand so that we may see you. Uh, this is Denise and her husband, Walter. Denise, her husband, Walter, they've been married for 13 years. They have two girls, as you can see, two lovely daughters, um, Dakota, who is 12 years old, Delaney, who is three. Um, they are members of Mercy Tree Baptist in Iva. Um, they have interest of always being with the family and just huge family emphasis, um, love doing things with the girls. The girls are involved with dance, softball, volleyball, and if all that is not enough, they love Clemson. So... Denise, Walter, great to have you guys with us today. Dakota, Delaney, Denise, welcome to the Grace um, ministry team. And just so you know, y'all can be seated now. Yeah, <laughs> uh, just so you know, um, Denise is going to be in, in and out of the office um, in May and in June. So she can be gleaning as much as possible from Kathy. And, and no pressure, Denise, but Kathy told me Thursday, she said it will be a smooth transition because Denise knows what she's doing. So, um, we're thankful for you, thankful for God sending you our direction. I would invite you to stand with me this morning as we join together with the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, these words that have been passed down from generation to generation in the life of the church, these words remind us what we believe. And oftentimes, I would imagine we can have the habit to just say these words and not even think about what they mean. But, but when we say these words, we're saying what we believe. We're not assuming, we're not um, hoping, we're, we're believing, we know when that we have a God, a Father, we have a Son, we have the Holy Spirit. We believe there is a church universal, the Catholic church with a little C, not the big C. A church universal that brings hope to this world. We, we believe there's life eternal and life everlasting. We believe there's forgiveness of sin. So we find good news in the Apostles' Creed. Let us join together this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We would just like to ask you to continue standing as we begin our worship and song this morning. Father, we do thank you for this church, Lord, and we thank you for the blessings you give to us on a daily and hourly basis. Pray that you'll be with Jason this morning as he delivers the word that you've laid upon his heart, Lord, and help us to be receptive and to apply it to our daily living. Now we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, This time I would ask, Miss Julia, you just sat down. I was getting ready to ask you to stand back up again. Miss Julia, if you would come forward, please. Many of you may, if you would turn and face the congregation, many of you may know Miss Julia. She's been a part of the church, and, and she wants to become a member of Grace United Methodist Church and moving her membership from Gilgal to Grace. And so, Miss Julia, I'm going to ask you the questions we ask all folks who come to join the United Methodist Church, and it's just two questions. The first one is this. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And will you serve this church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Miss Julia, welcome to Grace United Methodist Church.
If you will, take a moment, stand up, greet those around you, welcome them to grace. take this opportunity and this chance to continue worshiping God with God's tithe and our offering. Know that everything that we call our own, God has allowed us to have it. And God gives to us not so that we can hoard up more, but God gives to us so that we can then give back. And in our giving, know that God blesses the giving and God blesses us as we give. And, but also really knowing more than ever that in our giving, lives are being transformed by the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is why we, the church, exist, to share the hope, to share the love, to share the grace of Jesus. That's why we're here. And in our giving, we allow the ministry and the mission of this local church to go out in this community, to go out in this state, in this nation, and even in this world and make a difference in people's lives with the love of Jesus. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for how you pour out blessing upon blessing in our life. 
God, we thank you that you woke us up this morning. God, we thank you that, that you put breath in our lungs. God, we thank you that you caused our heart to continue to beat. God, we thank you for the chance to be able to be here with brothers and sisters in Christ and worship you. God, to sing songs, to, to fellowship, to laugh, to hear your word. And God, as we come here to do all those things, let us not forget the reason the church exists. We do not exist just to come in here every Sunday and sit down and hear a word and go home. God, we exist to make a difference in the world around us by sharing the love of Jesus. And Lord, let us be reminded that in our giving and receiving that happens in this place today with your tithe and our offering, that lives are being changed. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would go ahead of us. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would prepare the minds and the hearts of those who will hear the good news because of how Grace United Methodist Church gives. So Holy Spirit, bless the giving and the receiving and bless us, your church, as we are faithful to do what you've called us to do. In your holy name we do pray. Amen.
stand together as we present God's tithes in our offering. be seated and children can be dismissed for children's church at this time. Good morning. This morning our scripture reading comes from John chapter 6 verses 60 through 69. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, the past few Sundays, the past three Sundays, actually, we've been in a sermon series entitled Gamers and. We've been using a variety of games to kind of help us understand some biblical teachings, some um, words from God, some words from Jesus. And today we, we conclude this series with the game of life. How many of you have ever played the game of life? Maybe, sort of, not really. Some of you think, I don't play games. I don't play, that's why I quit school, because of, re I mean, you know, recess, you know. Anyway, the game of life. I have many, many memories of playing the game of life, and most of those memories come when I was a young boy and staying at my grandparents' house, my dad's parents, and, 
and, and we would go spend the night with our grandparents and my sister and I, and then we would get up, and we would play life. It was like a routine. We'd play life before we went to bed on Friday night, and we'd play life again before lunch on Saturday. It's, it's what we did. As I remember that, and I think back, my sister was always the banker. So somebody had to be in charge of making sure everybody got money, and she was bossy and is still bossy like that. And, and, and as I have been thinking back on this game, I, I've kind of thought, no wonder she won all the time. She was always the one in control of money, and, and, and I was not sharp enough to understand that back in the day as a little fella, but I was thinking, no wonder she always had more money than I did at the end of the game. Anyway. But I, I remember playing this game, and I remember spinning the wheel and, and trying to make some decisions because this, this, this game itself, the game of life, is, is set up, and it's set up as an attempt to mirror life. It's, it's set up in, in, in a way to, to help us to, to learn to earn and have the most assets at the end of the game, and, and whoever has the most assets at the end of the game wins the game, and whoever finishes the game first, you actually get a little more money than those, and you get money for each child that you have. And I'm thinking, where does that happen in life? I don't know. But the, the whole point of the game is, is to accrue as much as possible, to gain as much as possible. And whoever has the most at the end of the game wins. You know, sadly, that's how a lot of us live our life. Sadly, a lot of us live our life of reality like we're playing the game. Because in, in, in this game that, that you play, you, you're able to choose the direction in which you will go. And as you play the game, you, you will find there are Every once in a while, there are some different choices you can make to try to help you determine how you're best going to win this game of life. And again, many of us live our lives like we're playing this game. We, we spin the wheel. We try to get the next thing. We try to have more money, more stuff, the perfect car, the perfect house. And if we're not careful... We'll find ourselves wrapped up in playing this game of life that we will become distracted to what really matters in life. See, a life distracted, a life distracted calls us to focus on things going on around us. And oftentimes, we, we find ourselves focusing on things we can't even control. And in the midst of that, we begin to, to look at all going on around us, and we, we can become frantic, we can become worried. And here's, here's the deal with, with worry. I understand worry. It's probably one of my best gifts. But here's what Jesus does for his people. See, Jesus calls his people to leave worry behind, to, to not get focused on the things of life that can distract us from following him. And, and, and Satan takes a subtle approach. Think about this. Satan takes a subtle approach to people to become distracted with more. And we, we allow this game of life to put our attention, to put our focus, to put our allegiance on other things rather than Jesus. And Satan is good at using good things for evil purposes. Did you hear me? Satan is good at using good things for evil purposes. So in this life... That can become distracted. We ultimately have a choice to make. Are we going to choose Jesus or choose stuff? And your takeaway point for today, the main thing I want you to be thinking when you leave out of here is, is three words. I choose Jesus. It's, it's my hope, it's my prayer that when you walk out of here today, you, you can boldly say, out of everything this life has to offer, I choose Jesus above it all. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to be reading out of the message this morning. You can follow along on the screen if you do not have a Bible. We're going to pick up Matthew chapter 6 in verse 25 and go through verse 34. Hear Jesus' words from Matthew's gospel. If you decide for God, so if you choose God, if you decide for God, meaning you have a choice to make, if you decide for God, living a life of God worship, 
it follows that you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion. And maybe some parents are thinking, uh-huh, I'm going to use that on my kids next time. Maybe some husbands are thinking, uh-huh, I'm going to use that on my wife next time. Anyway, we're going on. There is far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach and more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God, and you count far more to him than birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror ever gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk out into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop. But have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The ten best-dressed men and women in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. This is the word of God for the people of God. So these words from Matthew's gospel, we're picking up in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, if you were not aware. Jesus is sharing the Sermon on the Mount, and that's in Matthew's gospel, chapters 5 through 7, and we're picking up in the middle. And what Jesus has been talking about just prior to what we read, Jesus has been talking about and coming to the conclusion part of his preaching and teaching on possessions and money and stuff. And the use of money. And so as he's bringing all this to a conclusion, the message says it this way. If you decide for God, after hearing all this I've said, Jesus is saying, if you decide for God, meaning you have a choice to make. And what Jesus has just said is that you can't serve two masters. You can only serve one. You can serve God or you can serve stuff. Some translations call it mammon. And mammon is not just money, it's stuff. It's possessions. And Jesus is saying, you can only have one master, so you got to choose. Is it me or is it stuff? And it's my prayer for us today, church, from the pulpit all the way back, because I'm not exempt from falling into a life distracted, I promise you. It's my hope from the pulpit all the way back that I will choose Jesus and that you will choose Jesus, that we can walk out of this place today and boldly say, I choose Jesus. But we read these words from, from Matthew's gospel, and we read them from the message, and another translation says it begins this way, rather than beginning, if you decide for God, it begins this way. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not, is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? See, I read all this, and I'm just going to be a little honest with you this morning. I read all this, and I think, seriously, Jesus? Seriously, you're telling us not to worry about some of the essential things in life? You're telling us to not be concerned about essential and necessary things of life? You're telling us not to be concerned with our food and what we're going to drink? Um, Jesus, you made us. You know food and water is essential. You're telling us not to be concerned about that? You're telling us not to be concerned about our bodies? I mean, for the most part, we all want healthy bodies. And if you think about what's happening in this country right now, fitness and health is like a multi-billion dollar industry. But you're telling us not to be concerned about our bodies? As for what I will wear, Jesus, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm sure I don't want to be seen without clothes. And I'm pretty positive nobody else wants me to be without clothes. So you're telling me not to worry about all these things? I'm not real sure where you're going with all this. So we read this passage, and out of all the passages in Scripture about trusting God, this is probably one of the most real but most loved and hard to sort through passages of practical everydayness of following Jesus. To not worry about the things that can distract your life. 
but to keep your focus on Jesus. The Apostle Paul said it very similar in Philippians chapter 4 when he says, have no anxiety about anything. And I'm thinking, well, I already messed that one up, Paul, because I can get anxious about a lot of things. But Paul says, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. See, Paul was taking Jesus' words and reframing it. Don't worry about things that you can't control. Don't be anxious about things. Rather, pray about it. Pray about it. And have some thanksgiving. Look at what you have, not what you don't have. As my daddy always says, son, if you want to get rich quick, count your blessings. But we read these words and we, we hear these words from Jesus and let us think back to some of the original context in which Jesus spoke these words. He spoke these words to disciples. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was preaching to people and teaching to people, telling them, if you follow me, this is what your life will look like. It's not, do this and then you'll be a disciple. Jesus is saying, no, follow me and your life will begin to take shape and look like this. And we think about the original context and think about his disciples, the 12 that we often think of, but they were more than that. But the 12 we often think of, some of those folks left their jobs in order to follow Jesus so that they could be full-time with Jesus and full-time spreading the ministry and mission of, of his love and grace. And maybe you're thinking, but dude, that ain't me. Jesus ain't calling me to stop my job. Well, he might not, but he may. But the ultimate question is, how are you sharing Jesus in everything you do? And when it comes down to one of the most distracting things in life, money, possessions, and stuff, is that your master or is Jesus? I choose Jesus. And Jesus went on in, in, these, in these words from Matthew's gospel, and he says, think about the birds and the flowers. Think about how God cares for them. And maybe, just maybe when Jesus is inviting us to think how God cares for nature, for the birds, for the flowers... Maybe, just maybe, Jesus is wanting us to stop putting our attention on the frantic pursuit of more and all these necessities of life that we think we must have. Maybe Jesus is wanting us to have a calmer vision of what we already have and how God is so faithfully provides everything that we need. And maybe we can read this and think, also, if God is so faithful about caring for the birds and the flowers, then what about the poor, Jason? And then we go on and we read Jesus' teachings and we are reminded that those who have, have because they are to help the poor, the needy. They are to feed the hungry, give the thirsty something to drink, clothe the naked. See, those who have plenty are not allowed by God to have plenty so that they may gain more. Those who have plenty are allowed by God to have plenty so that they can help those who are in need. God has a biased favor for the poor. And Jesus says, the poor you will always have with you. So that calls us to consider, what are we going to do with what God has given us? Will we become distracted by the game of life and allow all the stuff, possessions, and money to become our master, or will we choose Jesus to be our master? And, and I will go ahead and let you know ahead of time, if you have not already figured this out, choosing Jesus to be your master will change how you live, will change how you spend money, will change what you do with your stuff. It will give you a whole new perception and reality and just being reminded that this junk ain't mine anyway. It's only on loan for as long as I'm breathing. And as soon as I'm gone, somebody else is going to snatch it up. Probably won't even be cold yet, and somebody will be coming to get it. See, all this stuff goes away, and the one thing that does not go away is Jesus. Because it's Jesus who said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I choose Jesus. There's, there's a poem that speaks the same message, very similar message. You may be familiar with this poem. It's a Robert Frost poem. It's entitled, The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. I'm sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, 
and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two rows diverged in a wood and I. I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. See, when we choose Jesus, we take the road less traveled by, and I will promise you that will make all the difference. It will make all the difference in your life. It will make all the difference in the lives of those around you and the world in which you live when we stop being distracted by the things of life and choose Jesus over it all. So with Jesus' words, he makes the choice clear. We decide what will be our master. And just I'm going to throw a little nugget out there. i got a few minutes of time. Sign kind of a short sermon. So let me throw a couple of nuggets there. We read the words of Jesus. And Jesus is intent that he desires for people to follow him, all people to follow him, no matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been. Jesus says, you can follow me. Just choose me. Love me and love others. And that's, that's what I require of you. And what I find so amazingly difficult to understand sometimes for we the church myself included is that we can spend so much time arguing about what Jesus never mentioned and we'd rather spend more time ignoring what Jesus said so that we can get on our soapbox and preach about what we want to preach about But Jesus says, you love me and you love others and you follow me and that's going to make all the difference. And it's going to be a road less traveled, but I'm inviting you to do it. To not be distracted by the things of life, but to be focused on me. To share me and let me work out the details is what Jesus is inviting us to do. And so Jesus says, what are you going to choose? Are you going to choose the stuff of the world or are you going to choose me? And we can find ourselves all distracted by life with, with worry. See, and worry is really a symptom of what you depend on and where you put your trust. Did you hear me? Worry is a symptom of what you depend on and where you put your trust. And a, a months ago, I was just sleepless and, and restless at night, worrying about things, anxious about things. And I woke up. Alarm was going off. I've been tossing and turning all night. And I was like, God, something's got to give. And as soon as I said it, it's like the Holy Spirit said, won't you let me worry about stuff? You give it to me and let me worry about it. And I said, gotcha. Done. But life distracted. Another little nugget. We can become distracted about things that really don't matter in reality. Just being honest. And I'm getting ready to say this, and if it offends you, I'm sorry. But a few weeks ago, there was a big uproar come out in the news, and especially on social media, because that's where everybody gets their news, it seems, these days. And there was some disgruntledness between the company Yeti and the NRA. In the midst of this, I, I saw so many people on social media saying I'm getting rid of my Yeti coolers, my Yeti cups they're blowing them up with guns and stuff and I'm thinking what in the world are you doing but as I'm scrolling through and people are just ranting and raving and venting I came to the thought what if we spent that much energy sharing Jesus than worried about a cooler company in the NRA and if that offends you, I'm sorry. Not really. If that offends you, that might want to cause you to really take a check at your heart and see what's your master. Because only one is ever going to die for you, and his name is Jesus. See, this game of life, this game of life can distract us. And we can find ourselves a church telling everybody, everything we're against rather than telling what we're for and we're for Jesus because I choose Jesus 
And Jesus calls us to love all people, and Jesus calls us to love him, and Jesus just calls us to share that love with others. That's it. And we make it so hard, and I choose Jesus. And that's a choice that every one of us have to make, and you heard the words that Heather read this morning from the Gospel of John, and, and just kind of a little bit of context as we wrap some things up this morning. What Heather read follows after Jesus had fed the multitude with some fish and some bread. And after feeding this multitude of people, these thousands of people, Jesus and his disciples then go on and and the crowd follows Jesus because they still want some food. They're hungry. And so Jesus begins to unpack for these disciples that have been following him, not just the twelve, but these multitudes of disciples that have been following him. He began to unpack for them what it truly means to follow him, that he has to be in and about everything in their life. And what Heather read to us this morning reminds us those people were given a choice that day, and just like we're given a choice. And John's gospel records how when people really began to hear what Jesus meant when it says to follow him, that your whole life is focused on him, not distracted by the junk of life, but fully focused on him. It says that the crowd, the, the multitude, the disciples that were already following said these teachings are too difficult for us. And they left. They left. And Jesus looks to the twelve at this point. He says, what about you? What about y'all? He was super southern a little bit. What about y'all? Y'all going away too? And Peter, being the spokesperson for the group, speaks up and he says, Lord, where can we go? Where can we go? It's you who has the words of eternal life. In essence, what Peter was saying is, we choose Jesus. Because all this stuff goes away. I'm choosing Jesus. Because that is my hope. I choose Jesus. Today we celebrate Holy Communion. We're not only reminded of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, But let us also be reminded that because of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, he chose you. Did you hear me? He chose you. In the midst of all that we can be in, just ugly, rotten, nasty people, every one of us have the potential to be nasty people. He chose you because he loves you. And what Jesus asks is for you because of his great love for you to love him back and love others. And that's what he calls you to do. But we remember this great love of Jesus. The night in which he sat with his disciples before his arrest, before his trial, before his death, he sat with his disciples, those who would betray, deny, and desert, He still chose them. But he sat with them and he took bread and he lifted it up to God and he gave thanks to God. And he broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat from this, all of you. This is my body given for you. When the meal was over, he took the cup. He lifted it up to God. He gave thanks to God. Then he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and drink from this, all of you, not not some of you, all of you. Take and drink of this. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this often, and as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So, Lord Jesus, in remembrance of your mighty acts of salvation, the giving of your body and the pouring out of your blood, we are here in this place today. And we pray, Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would be present with us as we come to this table. That we would experience your grace anew. We would be reminded that you chose us and you call us to choose you above all things. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make this bread and this wine be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we, your church, may be the body of Christ redeemed by his precious, precious blood.
God, as we prepare our minds and hearts to come to your table, let us know and let us believe that you invite us all here, no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter what we're thinking right now. You invite us all to your table because you love us all. And God, as we prepare our minds and hearts and hear the invitation, let us also take a moment of silent confession before you. Almighty God, we confess that we have not loved you with all that we are. We confess that we have not oftentimes loved our neighbor the way we love ourselves. God, we have oftentimes not heard the cry of the needy. Lord, and in maybe times of hearing the cry of the needy, we have turned a deaf ear. God, we have found ourselves distracted by all the stuff of life. And we have chose to focus upon that rather than focus on you. So, Lord God, forgive us, we pray. And may we choose you each and every day of our life. Amen. A word of invitation and a word of instruction. Again, you are invited to this table. And Christ invites all people to this table. A word of instruction, there will be a servant station at each section of chairs. If you, as you come, come with open hands to receive the bread. That's the only way we can come to Christ is with open hands. Bread will be placed into your hand. Take the bread, dip it into the cup, and then place it into your mouth. You may stop at the altar for prayer or you may circle back to your seat and as you are coming, I would invite you to sing and, and to reflect upon the song that we will sing during Holy Communion, Great is Thy Faithfulness. If my servers would please come at this time.
Before we receive the benediction, um, hopefully you heard me say at the at the beginning of the service, we at Grace are notorious for believing in the power of prayer. Um, many of you may know um, Barry's been sick for a while, has some ups and downs, and um, if we could, I'd like for us to church to have a special time of prayer for Barry. Uh, Barry, would you you feel like coming up here? Would that be okay? And I would invite us to church, all who are willing and want to, to come circle around he and Cheryl as we lift them up in prayer. God's word tells us that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. And this church is full of righteous people. Not perfect, but righteous, filled with grace and love of people. Let us pray together for Barry and for Cheryl. Almighty good God, you are faithful. God, as we just finished singing of your faithfulness, Lord, we are reminded that it is you. It is you who are faithful. It is you who never leaves us. It is you who is the great and mighty physician. It is you who is able to heal. God, it is you and full of power through the work of your Holy Spirit that can do things beyond our imagination. Almighty God, I lift up to you, Barry and Cheryl. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bring healing to his body. God, that you would work in a mighty and miraculous way. God, that you would do what only you can do. And God, you would heal him and give him, Lord, strength, give him energy, give him the ability to just feel whole and new once again. 
God, we pray that you will give them strength, give Cheryl strength, give them both your peace that you promised, Lord, a peace that passes all understanding, a peace that the world cannot comprehend. God, we lift up Barry and Cheryl to you, knowing, knowing, Lord God, that you are in control, knowing, Lord God, that you work when we can't even see you working. But, God, you are working through the power of your Holy Spirit. You are working. And in the name of Jesus, Lord, we do pray that you bring, at this moment, Lord, you bring healing to Barry. Lord, you touch his body. Lord, we claim it in the powerful name of Jesus, the name that is above all names. Lord God, we lift them up, lift up against Cheryl. Lord, be with them, encourage them, strengthen them as they know it is you. It is you, Lord God, who holds them in your good and righteous right hand. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus, the Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. As you're making your way back to your seat, let's, let's stand together to receive the benediction, to receive the good news that is ours, and in receiving good news and receiving a gift. Y'all, we can't receive a gift with hands in our pockets. We can't receive a gift with arms crossed. We receive gift with arms open wide, and the benediction is a gift from our God. Let us receive the blessing that is ours this day. Let us go. Let us go in the love and the hope of God the Eternal, God the Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join hands together.